Section 20 of Villette by Charlotte Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leanne Fortune. Section 20. As soon as Georgette was well, Madame sent her away into the country. I was sorry. I loved the child, and her loss made me poorer than before. But I must not complain. I lived in a house full of robust life. I might have had companions, and I chose solitude. Each of the teachers in turn made me overtures of special intimacy. I tried them all. One I found to be an honest woman, but a narrow thinker, a coarse feeler, and an egotist. The second was a Parisienne, externally refined, at heart corrupt, without a creed, without a principle, without an affection. Having penetrated the outward crust of decorum in this character, you found a slough beneath. She had a wonderful passion for presence. And in this point, the third teacher, a person otherwise characterless and insignificant, closely resembled her. This last named had also one other distinctive property, that of avarice. In her reigned the love of money for its own sake. The sight of a piece of gold would bring into her eyes a green glisten, singular to witness. She once, as a mark of high favour, took me upstairs, and opening a secret door, showed me a hoard, a mass of coarse large coin, about fifteen guineas, in five franc pieces. She loved this hoard as a bird loves its eggs. These were her savings. She would come and talk to me about them with an infatuated and persevering dotage. Strange to behold in a person not yet twenty-five. The Parisienne, on the other hand, was prodigal and profligate. In disposition, that is, as to action, I do not know. That latter quality showed its snakehead to me but once, peeping out very cautiously. A curious kind of reptile it seemed judging from the glimpse I got. Its novelty whetted my curiosity. If it would have come out boldly, perhaps I might philosophically have stood my ground and coolly surveyed the long thing from forked tongue to scaly tail tip. But it merely rustled in the leaves of a bad novel and, on encountering a hasty and ill-advised demonstration of wrath, recoiled and vanished hissing. She hated me from that day. This Parisian was always in debt, her salary being anticipated not only in dress, but in perfumes, cosmetics, confectionery and condiments. What a cold, callous epicure she was in all things. I see her now, thin in face and figure, sallow in complexion, regular in features, with perfect teeth, lips like a thread, a large prominent chin, a well-opened but frozen eye of light at once craving and ingrate. She mortally hated work and loved what she called pleasure, being an insipid, heartless, brainless dissipation of time. Madame Beck knew this woman's character perfectly well. She once talked to me about her with an odd mixture of discrimination indifference and antipathy. I asked why she kept her in the establishment. She answered plainly, because it suited her interest to do so, and pointed out a fact I had already noticed, namely that Mademoiselle de Pierre possessed, in an almost unique degree, the power of keeping order amongst her undisciplined ranks of scholars. A certain petrifying influence accompanied and surrounded her. Without passion, noise or violence, she held them in check, as a breezeless frost air might still a brawling stream. She was of little use as far as communication of knowledge went, but for strict surveillance and maintenance of rules, she was invaluable. Je sais bien qu'elle n'a pas de principes, Ne peut être de mots, admitted Madame frankly, but added with philosophy, son maintien en classe 
est toujours convenable et rempli même d'une certaine dignité. C'est tout ce qu'il faut. Ni les olives, ni les perrons ne regardent plus loin, ni, par conséquent, moi non plus. A strange, frolicsome, noisy little world was the school. Great pains were taken to hide chains with flowers. A subtle essence of Romanism pervaded every arrangement. Large, sensual indulgence, so to speak, was permitted by way of counterpoise to jealous spiritual restraint. Each mind was being reared in slavery, but to prevent reflection from dwelling on this fact, every pretext for physical recreation was seized and made the most of. There, as elsewhere, the church strove to bring up her children robust in body, feeble in soul, fat, ruddy, hale, joyous, ignorant, unthinking, unquestioning. Eat, drink and live, she says. Look after your bodies, leave your souls to me. I hold their cure, guide their course. I guarantee their final fate. A bargain in which every true Catholic deems himself a gainer. Lucifer just offers the same terms. All this power will I give thee, and the glory of it, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. About this time, in the ripest glow of summer, Madame Beck's house became as merry a place as a school could well be. All day long, the broad folding doors and the two-leaved casements stood wide open. Settled sunshine seemed naturalized in the atmosphere. Clouds were far off, sailing away beyond sea, resting, no doubt, round islands such as England, that dear land of mists, but withdrawn wholly from the drier continent. We lived far more in the garden than under a roof. Classes were held and meals partaken of in the Grand Perceau. Moreover, there was a note of holiday preparation which almost turned freedom into license. The autumnal long vacation was but two months distant. But before that, a great day, an important ceremony, none other than the fate of Madame, awaited celebration. The conduct of this fate devolved chiefly on Mademoiselle Saint-Pierre, Madame herself being supposed to stand aloof, disinterestedly unconscious of what might be going forward in her honour. Especially, she never knew, never in the least suspected, that a subscription was annually levied on the whole school for the purchase of a handsome present. The polite tact of the reader will please to leave out of the account a brief secret consultation on this point in Madame's own chamber. What will you have this year? was asked by her Parisian lieutenant. Oh, no matter, let it alone. Let the poor children keep their francs. And Madame looked benign and modest. The Saint Pierre would here protrude her chin. She knew Madame by heart. She always called her heirs of bonté, De Grimont. She never even professed to respect them one instant. Vite, she would say coldly. Name the article. Shall it be jewellery or porcelain, haberdashery or silver? Eh bien, Dieu, aux trois culaires et aux temps de fouchette en engin. And the result was a handsome case containing three hundred francs worth of plate. The program of the fake day's proceedings comprised presentation of plate, collation in the garden, dramatic performance with pupils and teachers for actors, a dance and supper. Very gorgeous seemed the effect of the whole to me, as I well remember. Zélie, Saint-Pierre, understood these things and managed them ably. The play was the main point a month's previous drilling being there required. The choice, too, of the actors required knowledge and care. Then came lessons in elocution, in attitude, and then the fatigue of countless rehearsals, 
For all this, as may well be supposed, St. Pierre did not suffice. Other management, other accomplishments than hers, were requisite here. They were supplied in the person of a master, Monsieur Paul Emmanuel, Professor of Literature. It was never my lot to be present at the histrionic lessons of Monsieur Paul, but I often saw him as he crossed the carré, a square hall between the dwelling house and schoolhouse. I heard him too in the warm evenings, lecturing with open doors, and his name, with anecdotes of him, resounded in one's ears from all sides, especially our former acquaintance, Miss Ginevra Fanshawe, who had been selected to take a prominent part in the play, used, in bestowing upon me a large portion of her leisure, to lard her discourse with frequent allusions to his sayings and doings. She esteemed him hideously plain, and used to profess herself frightened almost into hysterics at the sound of his step or voice. A dark little man he certainly was, pungent and austere. Even to me he seemed a harsh apparition, with his close-shorn black head, his broad, sallow brow, his thin cheek, his wide and quivering nostril, his thorough glance and hurried bearing. Irritable he was. One heard that, as he apostrophized with vehemence the awkward squad under his orders. Sometimes he would break out on these raw amateur actresses with a passion of impatience at their falseness of conception, their coldness of emotion, their feebleness of delivery. Acute, he would cry, and then his voice rang through the premises like a trumpet. And when, mimicking it, came the small pipe of a Ginevra, a Matilda, or a Blanche, one understood why a hollow groan of scorn or a fierce hiss of rage rewarded the tame echo. Vous not donc qui de poupée, I heard him thunder. Vous n'avez pas de passion, vous autre, vous ne sentez donc rien, votre chair est de neige, votre sang de glace, moi, je veux que tout cela s'allume, qu'il est une vie, une âme. Vain resolve. And when he at last found it was vain, he suddenly broke the whole business down. Hitherto he had been teaching them a grand tragedy. He tore the tragedy in morsels, and came next day with a compact little comic trifle. To this they took more kindly. He presently knocked it all into their smooth, round pates. Mademoiselle Saint Pierre always presided at Monsieur Emmanuel's lessons, and I was told that the polish of her manner, her seeming attention, her tact and grace, impressed that gentleman very favourably. She had indeed the art of pleasing, for a given time, whom she would, but the feeling would not last. In an hour it was dried like dew, vanished like gossamer. The day preceding Madame's fate was as much a holiday as the fate itself. It was devoted to clearing out, cleaning, arranging and decorating the three schoolrooms. All within doors was the gayest bustle. Neither upstairs nor down could a quiet, isolated person find rest for the sole of her foot. Accordingly, for my part, I took refuge in the garden. The whole day did I wander or sit there alone, finding warmth in the sun, shelter among the trees, and a sort of companionship in my own thoughts. I well remember that I exchanged but two sentences that day with any living being. Not that I felt solitary, I was glad to be quiet. For a looker-on, it sufficed to pass through the rooms once or twice observe what changes were being wrought, how a green room and a dressing room were being contrived, a little stage with scenery erected, how Monsieur Paul Emmanuel, in conjunction with Mademoiselle St. Pierre, was directing all, and how an eager band of pupils, amongst them Ginevra Fanshawe, were working gaily under his control. The great day arrived. 
the sun rose hot and unclouded, and hot and unclouded it burned on till evening. All the doors and all the windows were set open, which gave a pleasant sense of summer freedom, and freedom the most complete seemed indeed the order of the day. Teachers and pupils descended to breakfast in dressing gowns and curl papers, anticipating avec délice, the toilet of the evening. They seemed to take a pleasure in indulging that forenoon in a luxury of slovenliness, like aldermen fasting in preparation for a feast. About nine o'clock a.m., an important functionary, the coiffure, arrived, sacrilegious to state. He fixed his headquarters in the oratory, and there, in presence of Benetier, candle and crucifix, solemnized the mysteries of his art. Each girl was summoned in turn to pass through his hands, emerging from them with head as smooth as a shell, intersected by faultless white lines, and wreathed about with Grecian plaits that shone as if lacquered. I took my turn with the rest, and could hardly believe what the glass said when I applied to it for information afterwards. The lavished garlandry of woven brown hair amazed me. I feared it was not all my own, and it required several convincing pulls to give assurance to the contrary. I then acknowledged in the coiffure a first-rate artist, one who certainly made the most of indifferent materials. The oratory closed. The dormitory became the scene of ablutions, arrayings, and bedizenings curiously elaborate. To me it was, and ever must be an enigma, how they contrived to spend so much time in doing so little. The operation seemed close, intricate, prolonged, the result simple. A clear white muslin dress, a blue sash, the virgin's colours, a pair of white or straw colour kid gloves, such was the gala uniform, to the assumption whereof that house full of teachers and pupils devoted three mortal hours. But though simple, it must be allowed, the array was perfect, perfect in fashion, fit and freshness, every head being also dressed with exquisite nicety, and a certain compact taste, suiting the full, firm comeliness of Le Basicurien contours, though too stiff for any more flowing and flexible style of beauty, the general effect was, on the whole, commendable. In beholding this diaphanous and snowy mass, I well remember feeling myself to be a mere shadowy spot on a field of light, the courage was not in me to put on a transparent white dress, something thin I must wear, the weather and rooms being too hot to give substantial fabric sufferance. So I had sought through a dozen shops till I lit upon a crepe-like material of purple-grey, the colour, in short, of dun mist, lying on a moor in bloom. My tellures had kindly made it as well as she could, because, as she judiciously observed, it was si triste, si bon voyant. Care in the fashion was the more imperative. It was well she took this view of the matter, for I had no flower, no jewel to relieve it, and, what was more, I had no natural rose of complexion. We become oblivious of these deficiencies in the uniform routine of daily drudgery, but they will force upon us their unwelcome blank on those bright occasions when beauty should shine. However, in the same gown of shadow, I felt at home and at ease, an advantage I should not have enjoyed in anything more brilliant or striking. Madame Beck, too, kept me in countenance. Her dress was almost as quiet as mine, except that she wore a bracelet and a large brooch bright with gold and fine stones. 
We chanced to meet on the stairs, and she gave me a nod and smile of approbation. Not that she thought I was looking well, a point unlikely to engage her interest, but she considered me dressed convenablement, décemment, and la convenance et la décence were the two calm deities of Madame's worship. She even paused, laid on my shoulder her gloved hand, holding an embroidered and perfumed handkerchief, and confided to my ear a sarcasm on the other teachers, whom she had just been complimenting to their faces. Nothing so absurd, she said, as for des femmes mieux, to dress themselves like girls of fifteen. Coin à la Saint-Pierre, elle a l'air d'une vieille coquette qui fait l'ingénue. Being dressed at least a couple of hours before anybody else, I felt a pleasure in betaking myself not to the garden, where servants were busy propping up long tables, placing seats and spreading cloths in readiness for the collation, but to the schoolrooms, now empty, quiet, cool and clean their walls fresh stained, their planked floors fresh scoured and scarce dry, flowers fresh gathered adorning the recesses in pots, and draperies fresh hung beautifying the great windows. Withdrawing to the first class, a smaller and neater room than the others, and taking from the glazed bookcase of which I kept the key, a volume whose title promised some interest, I sat down to read. The glass door of this class, or schoolroom, opened into the large berceau. Acacia boughs caressed its panes as they stretched across to meet a rosebush blooming by the opposite lintel. In this rosebush, bees murmured, busy and happy. I commenced reading. Just as the stilly hum, the embowering shade, the warm, lonely calm of my retreat were beginning to steal meaning from the page, vision from my eyes, and to lure me along the track of reverie down into some deep dell of dreamland. Just then, the sharpest ring of the street doorbell, to which that much-tried instrument had ever thrilled, snatched me back to consciousness. End of section 20. Recording by Leanne Fortune.